Hello YouTube family, this is Matthew Daniels of Sidetium Vererum. Um, today I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, this channel that I'm creating and what it's going to be about. Um, so it's going to be about mainly international relations, politics. Um, I'm going to focus mainly on foreign politics because that's, you know, international relations. That's more my forte. Um, with that said, I'm also going to touch lightly on domestic politics. So today I want to talk a little bit about the war in Afghanistan as well as the Powell-Weinberger Doctrine, and kind of apply that doctrine to the war in Afghanistan. Um, so basically, the war in Afghanistan, as you all probably know, has been going on for 18 years now. So it started roughly in September, October time frame of 2001. Um, continues to go on till this day. Um, there is the possibility of it ending potentially within the next three or four years, potentially depending on how negotiations go with the Taliban. The Trump administration currently is actively negotiating uh, with the Taliban, as well as the uh, Afghan national government is part of those negotiations as well. So we will have to see how that plays out. Uh, you know, we'll just have to see. We, we'll have to watch and see. There's no way to know, honestly, how this is going to work. Um, it's going to be very interesting, though. So without further ado, uh, we're going to basically take the Powell-Weinberger Doctrine and apply it to the war in Afghanistan. So uh, famously, it's important to note here that Colin Powell uh, didn't necessarily create this doctrine. It was actually a name given to him by like the media. Um, him, himself, as well as Weinberger, who I believe was the Secretary of Defense, uh, I believe under Ronald Reagan, but I'll have to, I'll have to fact check that and get back to y'all. But uh, at any rate, they got together and basically came up with this. And uh, it comes mainly from Powell and his experience as a military officer, um, the doctrine that basically he was taught so and that he used in conflicts. Um, it's a direct result of the Vietnam conflict, uh, basically trying to prevent another Vietnam so without further ado, um, it's divided up into different parts. Um, so here are the parts as follows. Uh, is there a compelling national interest? So step one, like, you know, basically does the United States need to go to war? Like, is there a vital national security interest? So in this instance, I would argue, yes, you know, 9-11 just happened. Um, there is a huge uh, emotional reaction, understandably so. Um, the public was demanding, you know, that basically those responsible for 9-11 should be brought to justice. Um, so with that said, you know, understandably so, I, I do think that, you know, the public at that time supported the conflict. Um, so I, I think that was justified. So that absolutely meets the PAL doctrine, you know. Uh, we wanted to go get Osama bin Laden. We wanted to go get Al-Qaeda, the United States, I should say, not we necessarily. Um, yeah, we wanted to do that, right? And so that, that's what was done. So I do think that that part of the uh, doctrine was met. Uh, the next part, international support. Did we have global support for this conflict? Uh, I would absolutely say that we did. Uh, the reason being is really, really interesting. So NATO, um, this is the first time that NATO invoked uh, Article 9. So essentially what that means is NATO is a collective security organization one attack on one partner nation means an attack on all. Uh, and this is the first time that NATO ever did that. So that's really interesting and highly significant. Um, there is an outpouring of support, not just from our NATO allies, but from various other nations all over the world. So, yeah, absolutely. The world at that moment stood with us. So that, that definitely was met. So we had public opinion was with us, international support. Uh, the next thing that we're going to look at is whether or not, let's see here, uh, whether or not, basically, what were we trying to accomplish, which is really interesting because I think this kind of changes. If you look at George W. Bush um, and his famous speech where he addresses the nation, you know, he's all about talking about justice and things like that. And, you know, we're going to bring these people to justice, uh, the military be ready. Basically, we're going to go and punish these guys for what they've done. And we're going to bring those responsible to justice, be that, you know, whether it's killing them or capturing them, what have you. Um, so that, I guess, was the original goal. Somewhere down the line, though, after this invasion, um, the U.S. kind of pivots 
more towards like a nation building stance. I'm not entirely sure why or what happened, but basically they go from hunting Al Qaeda as well as trying to like push out the Taliban to, hey, we're going to build a democracy, right? So what we're trying to accomplish is, isn't clear from the get-go. I guess it kind of pivots and changes. Um, so we never had a clear goal. It's interesting, though, one of the clear goals that we did have was basically that we needed to, to kill Osama bin Laden, kill him or bring him to justice, right? So that's, so that's interesting. I'll come back to that later. Um, so you've got that. The next um, part of the Powell Doctrine states that basically you need to go in with overwhelming force, right? Uh, you need to have overwhelming amount of force, basically achieve a decisive victory. He, uh, he, I qu I'm quoting him here. He basically says you need enough forces to achieve a decisive victory. So it doesn't necessarily have to be overwhelming. Uh, it's interesting. He actually, you know, uses this for like humanitarian missions and things like that. So just enough force or, you know, in the instance of humanitarian missions like aid or food or what have you to solve the problem, right? So uh, that's basically that one. Um, in my opinion, overwhelming force, it's, this is another interesting thing too that kind of shows how the, uh, the conflict in Afghanistan kind of developed over time. So initially, it's really interesting when we the United States first went in there, um, George Bush kind of used the, uh, the local forces that were already there. Um, there was uh, tribes there that were opposed to the Afghanist, the Taliban that were already basically had fought a civil war with the Taliban and lost, but they were still there. And they were under a uh, general. I believe his name was Masood. I need to fact check that and get back to you. But uh, I'm trying to remember the name of those forces, but basically now they're the ANA or the Afghan National Army, right? By and large, these forces make up the ANA. So with that said, um, we went in there with a very light footprint. So basically just with the airstrikes, um, overwhelming air support without a doubt. Uh, but mainly with like CIA and like special uh, forces types. So particularly like the Green Berets were utilized um, in these types of missions. And they were used with those uh, local forces that were already in place. And the whole point of this was to kind of avoid like large scale American casualties, right? So we never had the right amount of force, and then later on down the road, it becomes like a counterinsurgency campaign, like in the later years of the Bush administration, especially under the Obama administration. Um, Obama basically looks at this conflict and realizes that, you know, it's not necessarily going the right way, and um, famously, you know, authorizes the surge, which was used as well in Iraq. Um, so that basically was a surge of troops. I believe it was between twenty to 30,000 uh, was the maximum amount. Um, and there's numerous complaints uh, by various generals. Uh, Petraeus is one in particular. They basically stated that, you know, this isn't enough. It was never enough to, to get the job done. Um, in counterinsurgency campaigns, it's my understanding that you need a lot of troops. Uh, and they're going to be there for a very long time as well. Basically, it, it takes a whole generation to win a counterinsurgency campaign. Um, Twenty to 30,000 troops, that wasn't enough to control the territory, let alone secure the populations, which is what you're trying to do in an in counterinsurgency campaign. So overwhelming force, enough to deceive, uh, to achieve a decisive victory? No, this, this doesn't meet it at all, you know what I mean? Um, there has to be a political end game, either a political end game or a military end game. Like, how does this end, you know what I mean? Um, and is it achievable? And that is a really good question with Afghanistan. We've been there for 18 years. It's still continuing to go on, and we don't really seem to have an end game in mind. Um, it seems like we're trying to prop up a democracy, which isn't working too well, given like the level of corruption. Um, the president of Afghanistan has famously been referred to as like the, uh, the mayor of Kabul. Because basically outside of Kabul, he has no control, which is really interesting. So, see, so yeah, it's not going so hot in that regard. Um, it's interesting, too, because a clear and obtainable objective was killing Osama bin Laden. And we did achieve that, right? And it's my opinion that I think at that point, maybe we should have left. I think the, uh, the American public, by and large, would have supported this. Um, you know, I'm talking about like your average American on the street would have supported this. The politicians and the generals and things like that, that's a different story. 
But, uh, but yeah, so I think that's part of why we're still there, actually. Um, lastly, there's another thing that Colin Powell talks about, which is called the Pottery Barn, barn Rule. It kind of adds into this as like a warning, warning against like intervention. Um, so basically, the Pottery Barn Rule is you break it, you buy it. And this is one place where I'm going to kind of disagree um, with Colin Powell as well as Weinberger and that I don't think it's entirely applicable to Afghanistan. We definitely broke their country without a doubt. Um, you know, we drove the Taliban out. We destroyed a lot of their infrastructure and things like that and, uh, you know, bombed them and all that stuff. So we definitely broke their country, but in our attempts to repair it and things like that, it hasn't entirely been successful. So I'm not sure, you know, if this rule is applicable or not. It's worthy to note that, you know, the country already um, didn't have much infrastructure. Uh, didn't have, like, a, like a civil, uh, civil service or, like, other entities that were needed to build a stable government, especially, like, a stable uh, democracy, you know. So there's that. So I don't really think the pottery of barn rule quite applies when it comes to Afghanistan, but it is, it's an interesting concept and it definitely applies to like Iraq, which will probably be what my next video is about. So yeah, that's, that's basically the, uh, Powell Weinberger doctrine as a whole. Um, that's basically it. So yeah, if you have any questions or anything or comments, please let me know. Um, feel free to comment below. Please hit the subscribe button as well. Uh, let me know if you have other thoughts, you know, let me know if you're critical of the Powell Doctrine, let me know if you served in Afghanistan, what your perspective is, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, please, like I said, subscribe to this channel. Oh, also give my page a like on Facebook. Um, it's Scientium Verarum, and basically it's my, like, personal blog that I'm trying to turn into, like, a media site eventually um, that will basically just talk about foreign policy and politics. So, yep, that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much.